Thank you all uh, for attending. And I want to just take a few moments and kind of just say welcome to the US Energy Storage Summit. Um, sold out US Energy Storage Summit. So we're, we're really excited to have everyone here. Um, it's, you know, there's been a lot of interest and a lot of excitement um, about this conference and about this topic um, leading into today. So we're really excited to have you all here. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers um, and, you know, lots of different topics and content that we'll get into throughout the day today and tomorrow. So first and foremost, thank you for being here. Welcome. And uh, we look forward to, you know, an exciting two days. Um, just some housekeeping uh, before we get started. And um, now that I think I see most people starting to funnel in the room, I can actually introduce myself. Uh, Steve Proper, director of our uh, Grid Edge program uh, at GTM, and uh, work closely with our storage team on you know, putting together conferences, content, and market research and analysis, all Grid Edge related. Um, so um, I'll be looking forward to kind of talking with folks throughout breaks and, and getting to know some of you better and some of you I know really yep. well, and great to see you again. OK, yep. um, testing, testing. And we're testing mic number two. Uh, housekeeping, um, Wi-Fi uh, network is um, up here on the screen. Park 55 meeting, password is GTM storage, all lowercase. Um, for those of you who received an RSVP confirmation, um, Iguana Technologies is going to be holding a lunch workshop. Um, that's going to be held in the mission room, which is on this floor around the other side of the elevator bank. Um, so there is signs um, leading you over there, but it's basically kind of go to the left, go to the other side of the elevator bank. Um, you should be able to um, easily find it. Um, we have a networking reception tonight that all um, attendees are welcome to uh, attend, um, which is sponsored by Solar Edge. Um, that will be held out here um, from 5.30 to 7 o'clock. Um, and then just a note that tomorrow uh, breakfast uh, will begin at 8, and the program tomorrow will start at 9 o'clock. Um, with that, um, I just want to say, you know, we've had a really, at GTM, we've had a really successful 2015 um, year in terms of conferences. Um, you know, a number of you have been to other, our other conferences this year. They've been um, highly successful, and we're continuing to grow our conference program going into 2016. So just a quick, quick heads up on what's on the calendar for next year as you kind of think through that. Um, we're having our first international conference um, next month, January, in Mexico, Solar Summit Mexico. Um, we just announced yesterday, most of you probably got that email, but we just announced yesterday that we will be hosting another conference here in March um, called California's Distributed Energy Future. Um, and this is a first one of our actual state-specific um, conferences where we'll be really looking to dive deep and dig into um, some of the specific distribution and um, electric grade challenges that are happening here in the state of California. Um, more information is available um, throughout the conference um, out there uh, with our folks about that. And feel free to ask me or anyone else questions um, related to how that conference is shaping up. And um, for those of you who were at Grid Edge Live earlier this year, um, we are expanding that program to Grid Edge World Forum, um, which will be held in San Jose um, June 21st to 23rd uh, of next year. And um, as, as the chairperson of that conference, um, I'd love to t chat with anybody who has an interest in participating um, from a content or a sponsor perspective. So feel free to reach out to me throughout the show. With that, great segue into just saying thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, you helped make this uh, event a huge success, so we certainly appreciate it. Um, for folks um, in the room, please make sure you go out and check out the various different tabletop displays, charging stations, and, and sort of other kind of uh, areas that sponsors have set up for you to kind of get, get to know each other a bit better and have some good dialogue around that. So thank you to our sponsors. And um, with that, let's kick off the content of the show. So our morning theme is energy storage behind the meter, sponsored by Enphase. Um, and to get us started this morning, ground us a bit, um, I'm going to introduce uh, our senior vice president of GTM Research, Shell Khan, um, who's going to come up and talk about the energy storage future. Shell? Thank you, Steve. And thanks, everyone, for coming this morning. Really appreciate having you here, and thanks for filtering in as you're finishing your coffee. So if you'll bear with me for a second, uh, I'd like to start by asking you to consider our water supply network in the US, the complex system of wells and pipes and filtration system that delivers water pretty much ubiquitously and cleanly to all of us, at least in the US. 
It's this really impressive feat of modern engineering. And, you know, it was a difficult challenge to make it as effective as it is today. But imagine how much more difficult that challenge would have been if just a couple things were different about the way that we get water in the U.S. First, imagine if the vast majority of the water that we get in the U.S. comes from a small number of large wells. These wells can power or can, can deliver all the water that we need, but generally speaking, they're relatively expensive to turn on and off. Um, and also, there aren't that many of them. They're just a few big wells. And second, imagine if we had no ability to store that water, if there were no such thing as reservoirs, no such thing as water tanks. That would mean that at all times, we would have to be basically perfectly calibrating the supply coming from that small number of large wells to the demand coming from residential and commercial and industrial customers and farms. And at all times, the system would have to be pretty much perfectly calibrated. That's basically the world that we've been living in in electricity for the past century. In the absence of energy storage, we have to at all times match supply and demand almost exactly. And then in addition to that, we have to make sure that the system itself, in the water analogy, the pipes, are, have the same level of pressure, basically, um, and that they all work. And that's an incredibly difficult challenge. And I think when you step back, it's impressive that electricity is as ubiquitous and as reliable as it is today, given that we've gotten this far without energy storage. Now add another layer of complexity to the water analogy and imagine if all of a sudden overnight we discovered rainwater catchment, right? And rainwater catchment is exciting because first of all, it's more distributed. You could put rainwater catchment systems up on people's roofs and also it's cleaner than pumping water out of these huge wells. So that's great and people start adopting rainwater catchment all over the place. But of course that creates an additional challenge which is that now you have to continue to calibrate supply and demand at all times and maintain the system of pipes and the pressure therein. But you have to do so with a new resource that is growing, that is more distributed, and that is intermittent. And you can't control when it delivers water. Of course, that's the, the corollary to the growth of renewable energy and particularly distributed solar in the electricity market. We're adding all this stuff to the grid that has many, many benefits, but also presents the challenge of maintaining the reliability and the low cost of the system with a growing intermittent resource. So with all of these challenges, it's amazing that we can go as far as we can without energy storage or without significant volumes of energy storage, but it's also emblematic of the reason why energy storage is so exciting and so important for the future of electricity in the US and indeed globally. But of course, that's not new, right? That didn't just become true. In fact, it's been recognized by people in the electricity sector for decades that energy storage is extraordinarily important for the future and would be highly valuable if it could be deployed at scale. But let's be honest with ourselves about the market as exists today. It's very small. We've deployed, since the beginning of 2013, the past three years or so, we've deployed about 270 megawatts of energy storage in front of the meter, another 30 megawatts or so of energy storage at the non-residential or the commercial level, and just about four megawatts of energy storage at the residential level. This is just grid connected, I should note. That's just not very much, right? And that's the beginning of 2013 through the third quarter of 2015. It'll jump some when the fourth quarter is over, but broadly speaking, this market is extraordinarily small, especially relative to the interest in it and the promise of it when you compare it against the size of the grid, the size of capacity of any other resource. And not only have we only deployed a little bit of it, what have we deployed or what has been deployed already basically occurs in two places. In front of the meter, we've deployed almost everything that we've done especially in energy capacity terms, in PJM, specifically for frequency regulation. So in the first three quarters of this year, all of the energy storage capacity that was built, of all of that, 86% occurred in PJM alone. And behind the meter, it's basically the same story, except instead of PJM, it's here in California. The vast majority of behind the meter storage that is being deployed right now and has been deployed over the past year or two has occurred in California, thanks largely to attractive rate structures, attractive economics, and the SGIP incentive program. So we have this market that 
everybody recognizes and increasingly the public is hearing about as being incredibly important. People use all sorts of terms, holy grail, killer app, Swiss army knife of the grid, but also a market that to date remains very small. And so what I'd like to talk about this morning is some of the factors that we think might drive the energy storage market to be a meaningful portion of electricity in the US over the next few years, where we think that might happen, and what that will change about the way that we are deploying energy storage. So let's talk about the market to come. And we'll split that up into the three segments, because something different is happening in each segment individually. So let's start in front of the meter, because in front of the meter is where the vast majority of the megawatts are getting built out right now. I mentioned before the geographic consolidation of the market to date. Basically, all of the energy storage in front of the meter that we are deploying right now is occurring in PJM for frequency regulation. Um, but that's not where the market is headed, necessarily. And you can use the project pipeline as a way to explain this. So we could start by just looking at what's been deployed. right? And you can probably barely see these bars at the bottom. You'll see why in just a second. But of what has been deployed thus far in megawatt terms, vast majority in PJM, as I said, a little bit less in places like California and Hawaii. But if you look at the pipeline of all projects that are in development right now, it's obviously a very different story. We have over four gigawatts of energy storage projects in development in California alone. Now, I should note, a lot of these projects will never get built. Right? These are projects especially that were in development in preparation for the utility RFOs, some of which are coming back now. And so we'll have projects that are falling out of the pipeline as time goes on. But even if you imagine that there's, say, a 75% fallout rate of this pipeline, you still have a gigawatt of energy storage, front of the meter projects that are supposed to get built out in California over the next few years. You do have a pipeline that is getting built out in PJM still as well, and actually in Texas, New Jersey, outside of the rest of PJM. Um, but you know, the, the trend in the market is from a market that is entirely dominated by PJM to a market that is probably going to be dominated by California. That tells you something about geography, but it also tells you something about both application and technology. And to get into that a little bit, here's how we see the market playing out in front of the meter over the next few years. This is our forecast for deployments yearly both in power capacity terms, in megawatt terms, and in energy capacity terms, in megawatt hour terms. And you'll see throughout this presentation, I use one or the other. We try to make it clear in any given case. It's important with energy storage to talk about both. And that speaks to the technology. It speaks to the duration. Um, it speaks to the use case. But the big transition that we're going to be seeing here, first of all, growth, right? No matter how you look at it, there's a lot more that will get built out over the next couple of years than has been built out in basically all of the history of energy storage in the US. So we're already heading into a market that is larger. But what's changing about that market is that it is shifting from a frequency regulation market in PJM, which means fast acting, which means low duration, to a market that is largely dominated by California, wherein the value proposition is more around capacity value or resource adequacy, as California often calls it, or deferral, T and D deferral. And that requires longer duration, typically. And so it's a different use case. It supports different technologies sometimes. And that means that in megawatt hour terms, the market will be growing faster than it will in megawatt terms. And it means that the average duration, at least in our forecast, will go from a low this year of about half an hour up to something like three hours by 2020. That also speaks to the changing use case that we're going to be seeing over time. If you look at that forecast from 2015 to 2020 cumulatively in megawatt terms, you could still see ancillary services, frequency regulation in particular, will be something like a third of the primary use case for most of the storage that gets built followed by capacity and deferral. But if you look at it in megawatt hour terms, it'll be a different story. You'll see more than half of it getting built out for capacity or for resource adequacy purposes, a little under a third for deferral, and actually relatively little. That should be 6% for ancillary services. You just have a much larger total addressable market when you're playing for the purpose of capacity or deferral than you do for ancillary services. Frequency regulation has 
you know, basically a total addressable market of about 1% of peak load in any given location. Once you add storage to it, that number goes down. So in PJM, it's already something like 0.7% of peak load. There's a market there, to be sure, and there are hundreds of megawatts that will be built out. But over the long term, where we see the big primary use case is in capacity and in deferral. The one thing on here that I haven't talked about that might be somewhat counterintuitive is renewable integration. You think of energy storage as being primarily or at least largely valuable for renewable integration. And indeed, that's true at the system level. Right? As we add more intermittent resources to the grid, energy storage becomes more and more important and more and more valuable. But we don't see the value, or at least we don't see a ton of value in most cases, in front of the meter of co-locating. We don't think that most utility scale energy storage projects are going to be sitting co-located with the solar PV project. There will be exceptions to this, and indeed we've already seen some of these projects in places like Hawaii where you have a particular need for it. But generally speaking, the value energy storage can provide to integrate renewables doesn't have to be located with that renewable resource. And so while all of these things will be providing value in terms of renewable integration at the system level, probably not so much at the project level. So that's where we're headed in terms of the front of the meter. Let's talk about behind the meter. And we can start with non-residential, and then we'll switch to residential. The non-residential energy storage market, or the commercial energy storage market in the US, is in an interesting spot right now. There's a lot of activity uh, and a lot of development. There are companies popping up. There are companies that are proving they can finance these things. But it's basically all happening in California. There's a little bit going on in a few other states, the vast majority of it in California, for demand charge management purposes. And one of the questions that we have as we're trying to figure out how this market is going to develop over the next few years is what it will take for other states to see attractive enough economics that you can have a commercial energy storage market, even just for demand charge management, that extends beyond just California or just California, New Jersey, Massachusetts, the few states that exist today. And so we've been spending the past couple of months trying to figure out how to model this out. And what we ended up doing was modeling out a customer that has a similar type of load, so we're looking at a large hospital uh, across all 50 states, and each of the 50 states we're including the largest utility territory and an actual tariff that that customer would be under, and trying to figure out what it would take for that market to see attractive economics so that you could finance a commercial energy storage project for demand charge management. So, there are a million assumptions that go into this, and I'm not going to run into all of them. Feel free to email us afterwards if you'd like to get the full list of assumptions that go into this. But the most important one is what we're assuming with regard to the cost of the system. So in the sort of base case assumptions here, we're looking at a large hospital. The system size is actually different depending on the state because we size it to 25% of that peak load, and we have different load profiles for each customer in each state, but it, it works out to something between 300 and 400 kilowatts, and it's always a two-hour duration system. And the cost that we're assuming is a 9% annual cost reduction starting, if you had installed it in 2015, around $1,000 a kilowatt hour, down to about 650 a kilowatt hour in 2020. And I'll come back to what happens if costs actually fall faster. This is, again, system-level cost reduction. I mean, if you look at this and you hear about the expected cost reductions in terms of batteries, you'll say, well, they're obviously going to fall faster than this. That may be true. It doesn't mean the system costs will fall that fast. We've seen this in solar. Though module prices were plummeting, system prices were falling a little bit more moderately because they are harder to tackle. So given those assumptions, it's also important to note that load is extremely important in determining the economics of commercial energy storage or residential energy storage, especially when you're dealing with demand charge management. So this is just looking at December 1st, one arbitrary day, for this large hospital that we're modeling across a bunch of different locations and looking at the hourly load profile. Just to show that even if you have a similar type of structure in all these different locations, given the different climate, you're going to see a different load, and that will impact the economics of the system. More so than in, in any other energy market, uh, if you're doing demand charge management, you really care about the customer's load at a very granular level. That makes it a little bit more difficult to do customer acquisition than you might have if you're just looking at, say, commercial solar, because you don't have to deal nearly as much with the minutia of a customer's load. The other thing that's important to note is that demand charges, what we're trying to deal with here, the primary value stream that demand charge management provides, that commercial energy storage provides today, 
vary significantly. This is just looking at that load profile and what rate they would be under for all 50 states and the largest utility in each state. And demand charges vary from as high as nearly $30 a kilowatt in HECO territory in Hawaii down to less than $4 a kilowatt in Duke in Carolina, North Carolina, and obviously everything in between. Which is to say, for commercial energy storage, you have a dual challenge here. You both have to find a customer that has the right kind of demand charge or the right tariff structure and has the right kind of load. This is a challenge that isn't going to go anywhere if you're basing your economics off of the customer's rate and the customer's load. But it also impacts where the economics are. So let's play around with the results a little bit. We're going to break this up into four buckets. And the output that we're primarily looking at is IRR, the rate of return on the project level. And we're going to break it up into four pieces. There's states in which the economics just do not pencil at all, where the IRR is negative. You obviously can't get a project done there, and you're probably not close to it. Then there's 0 to 10 percent. 0 to 10 percent IRR is an interesting case. You can't finance those projects today. For the, large, for the most part, it's really hard to do that. If you have a, an 8 percent IRR for a commercial energy storage project, you, you might be able to find somebody to finance one with a perfect system, perfect off-taker, and a fixed price contract. Generally, it's not going to happen today, but you're getting closer. 10 to 20 percent, now you're kind of in the money. It depends on who your customer is. Uh, if it's a creditworthy off-taker and you have a good contract, you can maybe get the bottom end of this spectrum and you can get that financed. Once you approach the top end of the spectrum, 20 percent, that's what people are financing frequency regulation projects at. That's basically merchant. So 10 to 20 percent is when you enter the money, generally speaking. And then over 20 percent, now not only is it attractive from a finance perspective, but you've also opened up the market to a bunch of new financiers who might not look at it otherwise. So here's how it looks today, given all of those assumptions. As you might expect, there just aren't that many markets that are attractive today. This is, of course, incorporating state-level incentives as well. And what we assume there as we move forward is that all state-level incentives that exist today exist as they currently are scheduled to and then expire when they are currently scheduled to. So for today, you have you know, four or five states that look attractive. And this aligns with the state of the market today. These are the states, generally speaking, where there's any activity going on in commercial energy storage. It's Hawaii, California, New York, Massachusetts. The one surprise on here is Michigan, which may have to do with the load that we assumed and the rate that DTE has in that case. Uh, it doesn't mean Michigan's a big market right now, but it does mean if you're in the audience and you're looking at commercial energy storage, take a look at Michigan. But you have three or four states that are really attractive uh, today, and that's just the market that we live in. And then a few states that are sort of approaching the cusp but just aren't economic yet. Let's skip forward a couple of years, given all the assumptions that I mentioned initially, and see what happens in 2017. It's actually not that much different. Right? You have a couple new states that have picked up. New Jersey becomes a little bit more attractive. You have some other states that are on the cusp. It doesn't change things in any substantial way, which is to say, if this is really how the market looks, generally speaking, you don't see that much geographic expansion over the next couple of years. And even if you build it out to 2020, things get a little bit better. Uh, you have states like New Mexico and PNM and Florida, FPL, that might pick up in some cases. A lot more states that are on the cusp in the 0 to 10 percent IRR range. So if you can get the cost of financing down, you might be able to get some of those projects done. Generally speaking, though, this is not, I think, a particularly bullish view on geographic expansion for commercial energy storage. You want this to go a lot quicker. And I think the expectation is, given all of the excitement in the market, that that should happen. So why isn't it happening here? Well, in part, it's because we're assuming relatively conservative system price reductions. So let's at least take a look at what would happen if energy storage gets cheaper faster than we were forecasting. So in our, the base case that I just showed you, it's 9% annual cost reduction, goes from about $1,000 a kilowatt hour this year to $650 in 2020. Let's look at a little more aggressive scenario that's a 15% annual cost reduction, gets you down to under $500 a kilowatt hour by 2020. And then let's run the same model again and see what happens. So again, in 2015, same story. Few markets that are attractive, generally speaking, uh, can't go outside those markets. But 
In 2020, under this scenario, things look a lot different. You have a dozen states that are in the money, which is to say at least over 10% IRRs. You have 18 more states where you're approaching that. You're in the 0 to 10% range. And in fact, a lot of those states are at the upper end of that range. That's the kind of geographic expansion that I think people would like to see and that you should expect if you want big growth in commercial energy storage over the next five years because you can't entirely rely on that small number of states otherwise. So what that's telling me is that in order for commercial energy storage to have a really drastic growth rate over the next few years, system prices need to fall pretty fast. A lot of people expect them to fall very fast. It's a necessity, not a benefit. And then it's also worth noting that you know, we're modeling out one customer type in uh, all these locations. There are a bunch of things that are specific to how energy storage works behind the meter that could make the market actually go faster or could allow developers and integrators and originators to find projects that are more economic than what we're showing you here. The first is more optimal load profiles, right? We're looking at a large hospital that has a particular kind of load profile. We chose that because it's relatively attractive, but there are customers who have peakier loads that you can reduce demand charges even more. And then the other side of that equation, of course, more demand-based rate structures. We're modeling out a customer in the largest utility territory in each state. There's obviously more utilities in each state, and you can find smaller utilities sometimes that have higher demand charges for which the economics will be even better. One way to show this is just to compare that same model just in California for four different customer types. We looked at a hospital, which is the one that I showed you, a restaurant, which has much, much lower load, a higher demand rate, um, and if you assume the same system level economics, the returns are much higher. A warehouse and a large office. You can't necessarily get a restaurant financed, you know, the off taker is probably not credit worthy, the system price might be higher, customer acquisition might be more expensive. But this does go to show you that the economics of commercial energy storage are highly dependent on the customer type. And you can have a pretty wide spread within even a single utility territory, depending on what the customer looks like. But in addition to those things, there are other factors that will improve the economics of commercial energy storage. First is secondary value streams, right? We are only looking at one thing. We are looking at demand charge management. And demand charge management is not the only way to monetize commercial energy storage. It's the primary one to date. But increasingly, there are alternatives. There's time of use arbitrage. There's self-consumption of generation if you have a PV system and there's an economic incentive to do so. There is aggregation for grid services, which can provide a secondary value. And there are some companies that have already deployed or are deploying systems that do both of those things. So to the extent that you can do stacking, that obviously provides an additional value stream. And I think that will be an increasing part of the market. But it is worth noting that it's hard to scale that very quickly. You need to sort of build up those value streams over time. And so I think right now, most people are looking at Demand charge management is going to be the majority of the market, and then you have a smaller piece that is growing fast that will add on secondary value streams. Better system performance. Of course, we're assuming that the system has a slightly extending lifetime as the years go on, but if the system actually performs better than we forecast here, then all the economics get better. And finally, lower investment hurdle rates. Right? If you actually can get a project financed with an 8% IRR, in a couple of years, that opens up a whole new market that you wouldn't see today. And you know, we have seen that to some extent in solar, where as time has gone on, the cost of capital for solar projects has come down, not nearly as fast as solar companies would have liked to have seen and could argue that it should have gone, but it has happened. And so you can make an argument the same thing will happen in energy storage. So to summarize the commercial solar storage market, uh, it's geographically concentrated, but the economics do work today for customers where it is being deployed. A lot of people don't recognize that. They're, it is an attractive economic value proposition. Um, it's not at risky, given the IRRs that you see in the places where the economics are work today. If system prices fall fast or you can quickly open up new value streams, there is a very bright future over the next five years. Now let's finish by talking about residential. And as I mentioned at the beginning, residential, by far the smallest market, four megawatts deployed at the, that is grid connected um, through Q3 of this year. 
it's, it's just not a very big market yet, especially relative to the hype. I was trying to figure out a way to quantitatively measure the hype around residential energy storage, and I couldn't, couldn't figure it out. So I'll just say there's a ton of hype, right? And the market doesn't yet reflect that. But um, I do think that there is reason to be a lot more optimistic than you might think if you were just looking at the economics alone. The market as it exists today is not primarily an economic market for residential storage. It is about backup power, right? And I think when residential storage companies talk about backup power, a lot of times people roll their eyes because they think, OK, yeah, that's what you do while you're not economic, and then you got to get to the point where the economics work for the customer. The reality is the backup power market is not small, right? There are something like 3.5% of households in the US already have standby generators. That's a backup power market that energy storage can eat into. That equates to something like 3.4 million individual units. And that's about a billion dollar annual market. And what's particularly interesting about that billion dollar annual market is that one company, Generac, has something like 70% market share within that market. So you have a billion dollar market that is dominated by one company that uses standby generators, which customers don't love necessarily, that are dirty. Um, and that residential storage can eat into for a while. That is a real market to build into. So there is growth to be had in residential energy storage even when the economics don't pan out yet because customers do find value in backup power. But of course, you'd rather have the economics pan out. You can imagine a much larger market, a billion dollars being nothing in comparison to what the residential energy storage market could look like if the economics actually were there, if customers could see returns. And the tricky part about it for residential storage is that the incentives just aren't there for the most part. You know, you don't have big differentials and time of use rates that you can arbitrage against. You generally don't have residential demand charges. You don't have the ability to aggregate in most places yet. So it's just hard to find an economic value proposition for residential storage. But we're starting to see a few examples of places where the economics are starting to pan out because new opportunities arise for value streams. And so one example you can look at that I think is kind of interesting is SRP, Salt River Project Territory in Arizona. SRP introduced earlier this year a residential demand charge for solar customers one of the first in the country, um, and is now being proposed by a bunch of other utilities across the country. I think increasingly this is what utilities are looking to do about residential solar instead of increasing fixed charges, because they're not having a ton of success with increasing fixed charges. They're moving to demand charges. So we modeled out a project in SRP territory. We're looking at a large residential customer that has a 20 kilowatt peak load. So this is not representative of all customers, but these customers do exist. They have an energy charge that's, that's quite low, but a demand charge that ranges a lot and can end up very high depending on what time of the year you're talking about. They install a six kilowatt solar system at a cost that is pretty representative of what it costs in Arizona right now, and a four kilowatt, six kilowatt hour storage system, lithium ion, at a you know, representative cost. And the economics are sort of interesting. Solar alone now in SRP territory just does not make economic sense. And you can see this playing out in the market. SRP for residential solar had been about a 12 megawatt a quarter market pretty consistently for a couple of years. This new residential higher fixed charge and demand charge was introduced and the market immediately over the course of one quarter dropped from 12 megawatts to three megawatts and then continues to fall. So the economics of solar for a customer, a residential customer in SRP territory are not good right now. If you add storage, it actually does improve the economics for the customer. So that in and of itself, that it is net positive, is meaningful. But it's still only 8% IRR. It's not quite at the point where you'd say, ah, oh, this is a big market for residential storage. Uh, and it gives you about a 10-year payback period from the customer perspective. You can sign up some customers with a 10-year payback. Generally speaking, what you're looking for to see a market turn on is something like seven or eight years. So it's approaching economic viability. I wouldn't say it's quite there yet unless you find you can get it done cheaper or you can find an even better customer. So the thing about residential energy storage and the way it's going to play out in the US is that we're going to have to watch where there's, possi where there's potential for value streams. And the nice thing is that I think in a bunch of places, there are value streams popping up. Backup power should be considered its own value stream. Another thing that we are modeling out that we'll present some results on 
after this conference is just an announcement last week from Green Mountain Power, where they're going to be selling, or they're planning to be selling power walls, Tesla power walls, to residential customers. They'll either sell it to the customer, lease it to the customer, or give it to the customer and have the customer pay a monthly charge. And which one the customer chooses will dictate what level of power Green Mountain Power has to charge and discharge during peak times. Any of those don't work out purely economically from the customer perspective. We've been modeling it out and the, the value isn't there for the customer on its own unless you consider the value that the customer places on backup power, which should not be considered to be zero. If you consider that to be, say, $30, $35 a month, you can get to any of these things where it is economically viable. So backup power is a value stream for customers. Demand charge management, like I said, I think residential demand charges will become increasingly prevalent over the next few years. We may even see it in California. We're waiting to see what the NEM 2.0 ruling is. It's possible you could have a demand charge included in there. Time of use arbitrage. Rates are becoming more variable. Generally speaking, it's slow. It takes a lot of time, but as they become more variable, there is always an arbitrage opportunity. Over time, that opportunity trends towards zero because the more you arbitrage it, the less there's ultimately going to be to arbitrage, but it's a slow process wherein the value increases, you deploy a bunch of storage, and then over time it decreases again. So you've got a market there for a while. Solar self-consumption. The other big thing that's happening with solar right now is in the places where the states are debating the next iteration of net energy metering or their first iteration of net energy metering. Uh, there's a consideration in a lot of places to decrease the value that solar achieves when it exports to the grid. This is what already happened in Hawaii. This may happen in California. It was just announced in Mississippi. Anywhere where you have a lower export rate for solar, now you have an incentive to self-consume, which is an incentive for storage. And finally, aggregation for grid services. This is happening more at the commercial level than at the residential level now. But <clears throat> I think it will be increasingly prevalent at the residential level as well, where there are aggregators who aggregate up a bunch of storage, potentially with other assets, solar assets, load control, um, other generation, and then bid that into ISO markets or for utilities. They provide peak shaving thing purposes. They can do a bunch of things with an aggregated group of distributed energy resources, which will almost always include storage. So all of these are potential value streams that exist in a few places now, could be growing over time, and what you're looking for ideally over the near term are ways to layer all these on top of each other and find places where you can stack, because that's what gets you to a point where the economics work in the near term for residential storage. So to close out, what do we see happening over the next few years? Well, it should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway, the energy storage market is going to grow really fast, right? There's a reason why we, our first ever energy storage conference at GTM is oversold because there are a lot of people trying to figure out how to make this market work and in fact are starting to deploy things now, getting projects done, getting things financed. So we're going to see a lot of growth. This year we'll see something like 164 megawatts or megawatt hours rather installed over the course of the year up to what we forecast to be about 3.7 gigawatt hours in 2020. That is very rapid growth. Um, and like I said, that growth is going to be faster in megawatt hour terms than it will be in megawatt terms, but it is fast either way. And then the other thing that we will start to see, at least in our view, and this is you know, one that I think will be interesting to talk about in the rest of the conference, is the emergence of behind the meter as a significant portion of this market. Uh, we see a lot of Non-residential getting installed this year, maybe a little bit less uh, in terms of a share next year, but then over time, both residential and non-residential will be gaining share. And ultimately, we think we'll see behind the meter energy storage play just as big a role as the front of the meter will. So to close out, um, I think if you take a step back, the electricity sector in the U.S. is undergoing you know, three pretty dramatic transformations all at once and at different paces. You have decarbonization through which we are reducing greenhouse gases or we're planning to reduce greenhouse gases that are emitted in the electricity sector. Clean Power Plan is the primary mechanism for this, but some states are even preempting that and going further. So we have decarbonization. We have decentralization through which distributed energy resources are popping up in various forms and making the system more distributed than it ever has been in the past. 
And finally, vehicle electrification, right? The advent of electric vehicles and the growth therein and the potential that they provide to offer grid services and to smooth load potentially um, and from a utility perspective to provide load growth, which is something utilities haven't seen, is presenting a whole array of new opportunities. So these three transitions that are all happening at once, decarbonization, decentralization, and vehicle electrification, they're all very important. And if you look across them, the one thing that I think is cross-cutting and can act as a catalyst for all three of those is energy storage. And for that reason, I and we at GTM are really excited about energy storage and just thrilled to have so many of you here to talk about it with us and to teach us about how this market's going to play out over the next couple of years. So thank you very much. <laughs>